brothers and sisters, as we look to open the word of the Lord, this last day that we're meeting this week, shall we ask his guidance in all that is set before us so that we may carefully consider these words as to how they relate to us today and the examples that they are giving for us to follow. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you because we need you. We need our minds to be opened. We need to understand that which has been presented in your scripture and in those in the words of your prophet. Direct us now, Father. Help us as your word is open before us to understand that which we read, to understand that which you present, so that we may more properly apply this to our time and to the work that is before us. Guide us now. Please direct us. Show us that which you would have us to consider so that we may be more properly prepared for the work that you would have us to do. I thank you for those that are joining in this meeting this morning and ask a blessing upon them. Be with us now. May your angels attend us. May our eyes be enlightened by your spirit. For this, we thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we went over yesterday, the premise that is being presented is that Judges chapter 2 is a letter to the movement. We're going to go over several points of Judges chapter 2. We're going to be addressing some things quickly because we're going to be returning to it again on Sunday to dig quite a bit deeper, but there are some points that I think are very key for us to need to think about so that we are more properly prepared to study. As we've gone over the last couple of days, and a messenger of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land, and you you shall throw down their altars. And ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. So the weepers chose to sacrifice unto the Lord at this place. Now, do we have any idea geographically where we would find this place? That is a question for Sunday. Now, the point being here, we have first the first five verses of this chapter. In these first five verses, in three of the verses, the messenger of the Lord, which we've identified as Christ, is speaking. And we have a commentary in two of the verses. But in these five, what 
the messenger has had to say, what Christ has had to say, is being very carefully considered by the people. Now, is this not something that we should carefully consider for our own time? Well, we definitely need to consider it to understand all the implications. Okay. Now, Joshua 2, verse 6. <clears throat> and when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to, pos to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that prolonged days after Joshua or that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. Who had seen. So let's consider that for a moment. Were they walking by faith or were they working by what they had seen, working, working more by sight? Well, I don't think this is really making that distinction. Okay. I mean, it's just that they've, they've seen this. I mean, they, they're witnesses. They've had the experience. Yeah. So in this situation, for those elders that had seen the great works of the Lord, would we ascribe this to some of those in the Millerite time that had seen and lived through the experience mm -hmm. from 1840 to 1844? Right. That's, what, that's the way I would take this. Okay. Because the word really would relate more to experience. Okay. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Heres, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gaash. Now, here again, Timnath Heres is also represented as Timnath Serah. So we have two names for the same place, and they may mean the same thing, but we will return to this. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, no, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. So first generation, second generation, right? Mm -hmm. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. So when the first generation was passed, the second generation went off the rails. Mm -hmm. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord in anger. They forsook, they followed, they bowed, and this provoked. We are seeing here four steps. Well, they also mentioned they forsook the Lord in the next verse and served Baal and Ashtoreth. Is that not a repeat? Um, yeah, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So, so here you're going to have one, two, and then three. Right. And then he delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them. And sold them unto the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. So there's, I mean, there's these steps, but then they're repeated again. 
So first time four, second time three steps. So is this another repeat and enlarge? Or four, three combination, which is a type of repeat and enlarge. Okay. Possible. Yeah. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. For the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. So the second generation is being taught in the school of affliction the lessons that they needed to learn. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. Could we apply this verse, verse 216, <clears throat> to have an application that the judges were raised up sometime in the second generation of the children of Israel being brought into the promised land. Mm -hmm. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges. <clears throat> But they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their, gro their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted, corrupted themselves more before more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them. And to bow down unto them, they cease not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. Now, the main reason for, for doing this quick reading through brings us to Judges 2, verse 20. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, is this the Lord or is this Christ? Or is it both? And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because that this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers <clears throat> and have not hearkened unto my voice. I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. That, though, that through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein, as their fathers did it, did keep it or not. Therefore, the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. Now, why would the hand of Joshua be mentioned here? Why is it that this chapter is being bookended? with the words of the messenger and the words of the Lord at the end. Is there something symbolic that we need to consider in going through these verses that relate to the time in which we live? Well, there definitely is. Um... So 
so so one of the things which uh, before this meeting we were uh, looking at um, James White's statements regarding Exeter camp meeting okay which I think I think we need to look into in a bit more detail because he's going to be dealing with um, the the Waterton tent and and when I read this over, I saw how this really applied to the time that we're in. Well, would you like to share that? Well, I can. Let's do it. Okay. So, so just a little bit of background on what what we're doing here. So, so Stephen had asked a question um, the other day about uh, nailing down. August 15th as the time of the midnight cry. So so we have the story which we get primarily from Loughborough. So I, I believe it's his book that's published in 1905. So Loughborough was not at the Exeter camp meeting as he says, but he got his account from people who were there. And Joseph Bates was there and James White was there. And this is James White. This is in Life Incidents. And so, so we were doing some research on this. So we had um, in Froome's book, you know, it, it's a, on prophetic faith of our fathers. We can, he, he mentions that there is, um, I believe the, he's the one who mentions there's three discourses that are given of the following day after snow arrives at this camp meeting. Um, we have from, uh, it could be Spalding. Spalding talks about, I think it was the third day of the camp meeting that snow arrives. So the third day was a Wednesday, which was August 14th. And um, so we just have these, these different statements. We have Fandel statements, where he's basically just taking these other statements and putting together a story so people have put together a story from these different accounts. And uh, one of the things about Loughborough's account is he puts the camp meeting in July, not in August. And then he gives the message that was given at Boston as if it was given in Exeter. Because he, he's, he's unaware of, of the Boston account and we and I know we get from Froome that the date is um, the 21st of July in Boston where Bates puts it about the 20th of July uh, you know halfway between April 19th and October 22 so he mentions those two dates but really when we look at this account here so so I came across and the reason why we don't find this account readily is he mentions Exeter, but he doesn't mention Snow by name or, or Bates by name. He doesn't mention anyone by name. And so, um, I mean, I've probably seen parts of this, this account here, but I'd never really read it in the context of what we're looking at now. So, <clears throat> so we can go through this, and it's rather interesting how it relates to what we're studying right now. It was in the month of August, 1844, that the memorable Second Advent camp meeting was held at Exeter, New Hampshire. This meeting was large. It was the occasion of a general rally from all parts of New England, and many were present from other states and from the Canadas, that would be Upper and Lower Canada. There were many tents upon the ground, some of them resembling houses of worship in size and shape, more than the small tents usually seen upon Methodist campgrounds. These furnished ample accommodations for the thousands of believers present. There was a general agreement with all Adventists at that time that the special providence of God had directed the Advent movement. So we could put in here, um, you know, our movement. And, and where we're going to place this, um, is, to me, is, is, is a real issue because I, I'm taking the position, at least tentatively, that this is still future for this movement. And, and I would think that this story in Judges chapter 2 is still future. And 
So, you know, as we go through this, maybe we can discuss that a little bit. But the farthest point to which the Jewish year could be extended, reaching from March 1843 to March 1844, had passed. So James White here doesn't put in the April 19th um, date in 1844, which Bates does. <clears throat> and the believers were left in a state of suspense and uncertainty, evidently not enjoying all the inspiring influence of the Advent hope and faith they felt under the proclamation of definite time. And there were other things besides the passing of the time that cast a degree of general gloom over the second advent cause at that time. So we can say this about our movement. Um, so there isn't the, the inspiring influence of the advent hope and faith that, that we had under July, the proclamation of July 18th. We could say definitely the movement was much more united under that proclamation than it is at the present time. So there's a lot of a general gloom, I guess, is one way of describing things. Store's six sermons on the immortality question were being widely circulated among Adventists, and the doctrine of man's unconsciousness in death and the destruction of the wicked was being adopted by some and regarded with favor by many. The time had come in the providence of God for this question to be agitated, but its importance could not then be seen as by any as it is now regarded since the rise and widespreading desolating influence of spiritualism. Those second advent editors and lecturers such as Litch, Hale, Bliss, Himes and Miller who did not agree with Mr. Storrs not only failed to see the good that good could result from the agitation of the subject but were grieved that once united and happy flock who were looking for the immediate return of the great shepherd should have their minds divided by this question. And these men who felt the responsibilities of the great advent cause are not to be censured too much for their fears nor blamed too severely for their efforts to avoid the discussion of so sensitive a question. So he brings in here that there is other issues arising after their first disappointment during this tarrying time. And um, we can see that there's light that's coming, but it's not, it's not really being appreciated uh, regarding issues that, that don't address specifically uh, their disappointment. And while it was being feared that a portion of the Advent body were having their minds diverted from the all-important work of warning the world of the soon coming of the Son of Man by an unnecessary discussion of the immortality question, Others were causing divisions and were bringing much labor and perplexity upon the leading men in the cause by urging upon the flock extreme views of entire consecration, of Christian perfection, then taught by the Methodists. So, so what specifically would be these and, and the men of the Oberlin School, so Oberlin College? So what would be these extreme views of entire consecration, Christian perfection, etc.? Anybody know that the Methodists were? So this is kind of a holy flesh doctrine, right. correct? Right. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how many people know much about Oberlin College, but Oberlin, Yale, and Harvard were these three main colleges that uh, existed at that time. Uh, Oberlin doesn't exist anymore, but... Um, and it was a Christian college, basically a seminary, a Methodist seminary. Okay, and not a few of the men and women appeared in the Advent ranks who professed to be wonderfully led by the Holy Spirit. These took their position in, in advance of their brethren. Um, many of them soon became self-righteous and notwithstanding their apparent humility, were proud of their spiritual attainments so wonderfully impressed to do this or that and so directly taught by the holy spirit in relation to their entire duty how could they err the idea of mistakes on their part in doctrine or in duty was banished from them now of course things in our time are going to be expressed differently but 
can we see sort of this spirit existing in this movement at the present time? Yes. Yeah. Viewing themselves far in advance of their brethren, they were ready to teach even their teachers. And supposing themselves directly taught by the Holy Spirit, they were ready to reject the instructions and corrections of those who labored to help them. Such persons usually advance rapidly in their wild career. They soon fall under the direct power of Satan to be impressed and tempted by him to do this or that thing, which may be sinful. They labor under the terrible deception that all their impressions are from the Holy Spirit and must at all hazards be promptly obeyed. God pity the poor fanatic who is thus goaded on by the devil to disgrace himself and wound the cause of Christ. In no case could Satan strike the Advent cause so stunning a blow and so completely cover it with reproach as to lead on certain ones who bore the Advent name in the wild career of fanaticism. And he knows when to strike. The world has just trembled before the solemn message of the judgment hour, proclaimed with great boldness and power. And believers had lifted up one united voice in confident testimony relative to the period of their joyful expectations. But the time had passed. The world breathed easier. The scoffer triumphed. And believers felt they had all they could do to hold fast and not draw back to perdition. This was just the time for Satan to strike. More or less had embraced the Advent faith from all those religious bodies where the idea was prevailing that scriptural sanctification, purity, and holiness consisted chiefly, chiefly in happy flights of feeling and being led in the minutia of the Christian life by impressions. So people are just like God's kind of directing every little thing they do through these impressions. These had been stirred to the very depths of the soul by the proclamation of the second coming of Christ and felt that if they ever needed holiness, it was then necessary to enable them to stand when he should appear, and that if they should ever follow the leadings of the Holy Spirit, it was then, as they were engaged in the preparatory work for the judgment. And with these false notions of entire consecration, they were in readiness for the torch of fanaticism. If Satan could control these and bring reproach upon the Advent cause, and sat in the hearts of those he could not destroy, he would gain a victory that would cause wicked men and demons to triumph. There was upon the Exeter campground a tent from Waterton, Massachusetts, filled with fanatical persons, as briefly described above. At an early period in this meeting, they attracted much attention by the peculiar style in which they conducted their seasons of social worship in their tent. These were irregular, very lengthy, frequently extending into hours of intermission and rest, continuing nearly all night, and attended with great excitement, a noise of shouting and clapping of hands, and singular gestures and exercises. Some shouted so loud and incessantly as to become hoarse and silent, simply because they could no longer shout, while others literally blistered their, ha blistered their hands striking them together. The tense company was from Portland, M.E. Uh, -E is? Maine. Maine, okay. It was Portland, Maine, of which I was one of the number, had pitched close by this tent from Watertown before the condition of those who occupied it was generally known. Little thinking of the annoyances they were to suffer from these fanatical persons, but these they endured for a while in the hope that they would be corrected and reproved. Seeing, however, that they were not the persons to be reformed, and that they grew no better, but rather worse, the Portland brethren moved their tent to a distant part of the ground. But this act, showing the assembled thousands that we had no union with those we left, created sympathy for these fanatics. In not a few who viewed all the dangers of the way on the side of those who were disposed to formality. These joined with the Waterton people in the cry of persecution and shouted glory to God over it. 
as if a new and brilliant victory had been gained. Um, so I know I've, I've read a lot here, but, but any thoughts on any of these points so far? Any observations? The description of the Waterton tent mm -hmm. being very social. Mm -hmm. Gives an amazing description of what we're seeing within the corporate church and in portions of the movement today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we are, obviously the fanaticism expresses itself differently because we live in a different time. But the elements are still there. Yeah, the, the same elements exist. Now, and, and you can see the danger, too, of, of, of the people moving their tent away. Um, <laughs> the cry of persecution, which I find, I mean, humorous in some ways, just because all they're doing is moving their tent away. But even in those little things that we do, um, sympathies can be gained by those who are teaching error. And, and I would say that I participated in that in the way that I've tried to address some of the what I would consider fanatical ideas in the movement. And in so doing, I've, I've created sympathy that I didn't expect, that is, I didn't expect people being reproved for things that are error would cause sympathy for those persons, but that's that's kind of what's happened. Um, so you know we have to be careful when we're reproving error too, in how it's done, and and the timing of it. I mean we do need to reprove error, but um, one of the things that I've learned. Um, my, in my experience as a church, is that if somebody comes into your church and they're teaching error, if they're censured too readily, too quickly, that their spirit isn't really observed by others, that is, you know, we think we're trying to protect people, you know, from what these people are teaching, uh, it actually does more to promote the views of those people than if we allowed their character to be observed by others over time because the fear is always well these people are going to you know infect the church but uh by allowing people the freedom to be who they are and to and also to try to win them so instead of trying to oppose them and shut them down and and so forth you spend time befriending them and listening to them and trying to win them over to the truth Sometimes you can. I mean, not always. Mostly they just leave because often they want to have these conflicts because those are the things that they use to, as a witness that they're teaching the truth. And when people don't oppose them, uh, they don't really know what to do. But, but that's sort of an aside here in this case. Um, by this time, a general gloom was coming over the meeting. And the ministers who had the burden of the work upon them felt deeply. The wildfire was spreading, and how to stop it was the question. The people were told of the dangers of spiritual magnetism and were warned to keep away from that tent. But this only caused a crowd of the curious, incautious, and those who claimed a right to investigate and felt they were responsible to no one to gather around this tent. And it was evident that every hour, some were being brought under his, this influence, several of whom were suffering impulse to ride over reason. A minister possessing more natural eloquence than piety and real moral worth, while attempting to preach from the stand, was rebuked by a clear voice from this tent and thrown into confusion. Don't let me fall, brethren, said he, to the large congregation who were turning their attention to the tent from which came the voice. Pray and keep your minds upon the, the subject. He did fall in spirit and freedom, and his effort was a decided failure. Elder Plummer of Haverville, Massachusetts, who had the especial charge of the meeting, made appropriate remarks upon the condition of things, 
with great solemnity and deep feeling. He then prayed, calling on God for guidance and help in that critical hour. He prayed like a strong man in agony, whose only hope of deliverance was in God. He then stated something of his opinion of the spirit of fanaticism on the ground and exhorted the people to look to God for help and not suffer their minds to be diverted by the interruptions and general noise of the faction on the ground who were not in harmony with the great objects of the meeting. He stated in the most solemn manner that he had no objections to shouts of praise to God over victories won in his name. But when persons had shouted, shouted God to glory 999 times with no evidence of one victory gained and had blistered their hands in striking them together with violence, he thought it was time for them to stop. But if they would not ch change their course, it was time for all who wished to be consistent Christians to withdraw their symp sympathy from them and show their disapproval of their course by keeping entirely away from them. These remarks helped the people generally, but not those who were wild with fanaticism. But none among the preachers and speakers generally had shown up to this time that they had the burden of the meeting upon them, excepting what was seen in Elder Plummer, in reproving existing wrongs. Several spoke from the stand, but they failed to move the people. God evidently had a special message for that people to be attended with his signal blessing. Men of ability spoke of the great lines of prophecy, which proved that the advent of Christ was the next great event and of the signs that the event was at the door. But this was as familiar to the crowd of intelligent believers as the alphabet. Just then, as one was speaking with but little force and interest, and people were becoming uh, weary of being told in a dull, prosy style what they already knew, a middle-aged, modest-appearing lady arose in the center of the audience and in a calm manner and with a clear, strong, yet pleasant voice addressed the speaker as follows. It is too late, brother blank. So, so James White doesn't put who this is. Now, uh, we would assume it's Brother Bates that was speaking, but I mean, I don't know if we can prove it. Um, that's just from other accounts, but whether they're uh, mixing these accounts together or not. So, so I, I mean, I put Bates in there, but you know, maybe with uh, a question mark, whether it is Bates. But anyway, so she says, it is too late, brother. It is too late to spend our time upon these truths with which we are familiar and with, and which have been blessed to us in the past and have served their purpose and their time. The brother sat down and the lady continued while all eyes were fastened upon her. It is too late, brethren, to spread, spend precious time as we have since this camp meeting commenced. Time is short. The Lord has servants here who have meat in due season for his household. Let them speak and let the people hear them. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, Go ye out to meet him. This testimony seemed electrifying and was responded to by choked utterances of amen from every part of the vast encampment. Many were in tears. What former speakers had said was forgotten. And the spirit of fanaticism, which an hour before lay upon the burdened feelings of the brethren and sisters, like a ponderous leaden weight, was also forgotten. The attention paid to those in fanaticism and the opposition they were able to call out were just the coveted fuel to feed the unhallowed flame. And they were destined to triumph unless the attention of the people could be fastened in another direction. This done and their power was broken. By the request of many brethren, the next morning, the arguments were given from the stand, which formed the basis of the 10th day of the seventh month movement. The speaker was solemn and dignified and showed to the entire satisfaction of that vast body of intelligent believers. And, uh, and he lists three things. The, the first is the evidences which had been relied upon, etc., And um, the prophetic periods did not commence with the year 457 in the spring, but in the fall. 
and a number of other things, right? And then made the arguments from the types. So, um, so we can see here um, that um, this, in this account, so just sort of an aside from all the, the, the issues here at hand, is that there is a correction being made um, of, of something. But we are now correcting something, a mistake that we made. So my understanding is, or at least in the past, was that Samuel Snow speaks on the 14th and then repeats this on the 15th. But according to James White's, White's account, Samuel Snow doesn't present anything on the 14th. Because this is the third day of the meeting that Samuel Snow arrives. And this would be the 14th. So it's going to be the next morning on the 15th that the midnight cry is given. Though it is connected to the 14th here. Does that, that make sense to people? It's logical. Okay, so I, I'm just going to show you Stephen's drawing that, that he had done. Uh, no, he says he wants to correct a little bit of it. Um, so... Uh, I'm trying to get this. Well, I guess this is fine if I do it this way. There we go. So we don't need to see the the sides of that. Um, so we can see here the. Sorry about that. Can't move that cursor around. Okay, Joseph. So he has here on the Wednesday, which is the 14th of August, 1844. It says Joseph Bates on the third day given the pulpit. So. Um, now that's according to Stephen. Do you know who who says that it's on the third day? Wasn't that um, um, uh, isn't is that Froome or is that um, Spalding? Uh, Spalding. So Spalding says on the third day he was given the pulpit. Yeah. Okay, so so that would be on the Wednesday, which which I think is correct um, that Joseph Bates is speaking uh, when you look at put all the different stories together, and Snow arrives at the meeting, but he's not invited to speak that day. It's going to be the next morning, right? Is that what we're understanding? Yes, we don't seem to have any evidence. Yeah, we just have Loth Lothboroughs and then everybody repeating what Lothborough said. Correct? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to put this together in a paper with all the different statements and try to show how, how the story uh, got to where we have it as Seventh-day Adventists. But, I mean, the Adventist Church put out a movie called The Midnight Cry, I think it was called. Where I mean, I stopped watching not it. Tell, tell the down. world, no. What's that? Do not tell the world. Okay, tell the world. The, right, yeah. you're you're correct. Tell the world. I, had, I, I think I had like William Miller and all that, but he wasn't even at that company. Yeah, and and they have you know like a few people in the woods talking. You know, they couldn't even get. Uh, I mean, obviously it's budget. Um, it would take a lot to get you know 3,000 people dressed up in uh, uh, the contemporary clothing of the time and uh, etc. But um, anyway, so but when they do that, it's the Exeter camp meeting. So we all focus upon Exeter. Now we know in this movement that we have Boston, and that's where what Loughborough states happens is actually happening at Boston because he says it's in July but he puts it at Exeter instead of Boston. So he, he's mixing together different accounts because he's not clear about when Exeter occurred even, right? So he has it in July and, and he has, um, uh, it's gonna be Sunday forenoon that, that this occurs and that Samuel Snow is going to speak which he does at Boston because that's a Sunday and he does the morning 
service. Um, so, so, so obviously things got mixed up. Now, so we're so we have a, a misunderstanding of something, which is pretty fundamental to this movement. Um, understanding August fifteenth. And, and is this important that we're discovering this at this time? Yes. Most definitely. Okay, so why at this time is it important? What what would be the? Well, it proves prove, it proves the lines, the lines that you have. Yeah. Okay, here's the lines, but why specifically at this time? What is it that we're seeing in these in this account? It's establishing the importance of chronology, of correct okay. chronology. Okay, and I would agree there that it's it's a witness to uh, the fact that we need this chronology, that it's it's a part of our message, and 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 I don't know how this unfolds in this movement as far as but but the fact is we've been spending a great deal of time going through things finding amazing light from my perspective and and here we have something that this movement a detail that this movement hasn't really noticed and that would be similar when we go to early writings and we find that it's actually written on October her vision is on October 23rd not September 23rd, though the symbol of September 23rd still becomes important. The other thing is Stephen is doing the study on Ezekiel chapter four and, and was trying to nail down uh, because it's on August 14th that, that, that Ezekiel finishes his, completes his line, uh, somebody's, that's Jeff there, um, com completes lying on his, uh, his left side. Well, that, yeah, that, that on the 14th, he's going to lie on his left side. Right. That's the last time he starts. Right. So, it, and then, and then on, on the August 15th, and, and remember he began lying on the fifth day of the fourth month. So he began lying on his left side on July 21st, 592 BC. And then he's going to, the last day he lies down on his left side is the 10th day of the fifth month, which is, is a symbol, of course, of the destruction of, of the temple that's going to follow four years later. Um, that's actually five years later, right? Yeah, five years later. And then he, the next day he's going to begin lying on his right side, and that's going to be August 15th. So we have July 21st and August 15th marked uh, with the start of lying on his left side and the beginning of lying on his right side. So uh, that's pretty profound. That is, it connects, which we understood before, but we can see now this connection between the 14th and the 15th, the end of his lying on the left side and his beginning of lying on his right side. So if we're going to look at the 10th day of the fifth month, in this movement at the present time, where are we in Ezekiel's vision? Where are we in this, this event? Are we not in Ezekiel 8? Okay, but I'm just saying in the line on his left side and his right side. So he, he, he lies down on his left side for the last time on the 10th day of the fifth month. That's okay. July 18th as a symbol, right? All right. But it's followed by, the, by midnight when he begins to lie on his right side for 40 days. And that's going to be August 15th. So that's the symbol for the midnight cry, right? All so right. So he, he beat the 390 starts at midnight, the fifth day of that's Boston, right? It's going to be completed on the 10th day of the fifth month. And then he lies on his right side on August 15th, which is the midnight cry. And I would think for this movement, aren't we between the 10th day of the fifth month, July 18th, 2020, and this message being empowered? 
I would have to agree. Yeah. Now, the significance then of the 40 days, I'm not, I'm not necessarily certain what that means. Now, the 40 days end on what day, Stephen? Yeah, I was wrong the last time. It was the 24th of September. I think I said the 23rd. You, yeah, you said the 23rd, but you, it is the 23rd. So which, well, calendar be, you, not... which, which calendar are you using? Just, uh, just counting the days, you know, I think we're going into it in the, in the 15th. 40 days then. I think the, the 23rd will be the last day. He begins to okay. lie on his right side. And then he finishes on the on the 24th in the morning. Okay. Well, so I'm just going to look him. at Okay. So I'm going to look at my paper here. Uh, um. I wish I could remember the title of it. <laughs> um, here, I'll find it this way. So he's going to begin. Yeah, so. Yeah, so it's September 24th, you're right. So that's going to be the day, that's going to be the end of the 40 days from August 15th. And well, that yeah, that would be the twenty second day, sixth month. Yeah, the twenty second day of the sixth month is September twenty fourth. Okay, so it's the day after September twenty third, and and there is um, twenty three days from August fifteenth to September seventh when he has his second vision, and the second yeah. vision is what's the importance of the second vision. Well, it's one day before 666. Yeah, so so the second vision of Ezekiel is the one that we get uh, Ezekiel 8, 9, etc. All those things uh, are part of that vision. And it's on the fifth day of the sixth month of the sixth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. Um, but it actually extends into the sixth day because in that vision, he's, he's going to then act it out. And the vision is then all completed on the sixth day of the sixth month of the sixth year. So we looked at that when we studied Ezekiel. But it's 23 days to that vision, and then 17 days after that, that remain until uh, the end of the 40 days. So, so, uh, so it's interesting that those are the times he's lying on his right side, He's obviously not doing it continually day and night in order for, order for him to act out uh, the vision. Okay. Yeah, um, just another interesting thing is that 17 times 23 is 391. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, as he, and, and I was just going to do that calculation. Um, so 17 times, times 23 is 391. So that comes from of course, the 391 um, of the prophecy of of Ezekiel, you know, to the destruction of of Jerusalem or of the temple, 391 and a half specifically. But yeah, so that's pretty interesting. Um, so, th so there's a number of things still that we're going to probably find as we look into this further. Okay, any other thoughts about what we see here with James White's statement? Well, just another numeric connection is that the, uh, from the first cup meeting, which was in East Kingston, which was quite just a few miles away from where they were. Yeah. It was 777 days until the start of uh, this one here. Oh, okay. The, the 12th. 12th of August. So that was their first camp meeting um, with the tents, or? Yes, so it was their first camp meeting 
after they kind of been re rejected by the other okay. churches began to close their doors. Yeah, so then they so started the doing camp meetings. And then that was the first time that the chart was presented as well, the 1843 chart. Okay. So, so the first time the 1843 chart is presented, which is at a camp yeah. meeting, it's 777 days to the start of the Exeter camp meeting. Yes. Going to August 12th then. So now are you doing an inclusive or an exclusive count? I'm just curious on that. Uh, yeah, I think it's from the 20th of June when the East Kingston camp uh, began. So in 42. Yeah, 1842, yes. Yeah. Okay. And then it's just 777 days to the 12th of August. Okay, so that would be inclusive. Yeah, possibly. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, it is. So that... So that would be that would be counting the if it's the 28th of June um, to the 13th of August is 777 days. So would that then be 780 days? Yeah, that's <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So 780 days. And the significance of 788 days, can you remind us? Yes, it's um, the 18,720 uh, hours or something. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's the symbol for July 18, 2020. So has everybody got that? That's an interesting point. Yeah. So if we count from the 28th, it brings us to August 15th as an, as an ordinal count of 780 days. So that period of time from when the charts are first presented to the midnight cry is this number, 18,720. Wow. <laughs> and shouldn't people in this movement know this? Shouldn't we be interested in this? We should be able to recognize it, yes. Yeah. Now, see, the thing is, Odilia has presented similar types of things in connection with the mandates, which, which I believe are valid. That is, I believe his his calculations and the significance of, of, of those events in within our lines are being confirmed. It's just that some of the speculations connected with that, I would think, um, would be in error, right? So, but we can see that this has been witnessed to various times in different ways. So this 18,720 hours can't be just brushed aside. All right, so there's there's the calculator showing it. And and so it's easy to confirm um, you know something like this. It doesn't take a lot of um, a lot of knowledge to to do the research and confirm this. So, so what does this mean as far as where we are at in this movement and this message of Judges chapter 2? I mean, and you have some more planned for Sunday, you're saying. Correct. That, that, that we will notice. Um, so, so why is this happening uh, to this movement? the light that we're receiving, like what we had today, to me is just a miracle that we can notice something like this. We've had the conversation over the last several weeks about the Watertown camp meeting. Okay. Where, as we were aware that there was one tent with fanaticism, 
mm -hmm. one tent that did not have the fanaticism. And that it was to the tent presenting the situation with snow. When he came to give these, these presentations, mm -hmm. that the believers began to listen because snow was giving a an example based upon scripture but based also upon chronology mm -hmm. now if we're going to choose to set aside chronology yeah if there are going to be those that are going to say that this is too hard too difficult that we need to rely only upon a different type of message then are we not setting aside scripture and choosing to worship other gods? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's, I mean, there's no doubt that chronology is part of this movement. Um, and, and to me, as I've said many times, it's, it's an objective measure. Well, it doesn't have those subjective elements. I mean, what I'm, what I'm looking at, In 1838, a message began to be given about the fall of Islam. Yeah. Was that not based upon chronology? Mm hmm Now, it took two years for this to be noticed and to be accepted. But at the end of those two years, what does Mrs. White describe this as? How does she see this tarrying time from 1838 to 1840 in this revelation? Does she not describe it as a great manifestation of the power of God? Yeah. This period of 1,533 days which we know is, is a powerful symbol. And, and she compares it to the Exodus, which occurs in 1533 BC. Now, in all of this situation, we're being given symbol after symbol without any kind of fanaticism, mm -hmm. without any kind of emotional connections without any kind of political connections yeah yeah and by emotional connections you mean the emotional ties to people correct yeah that, that's sort of the spirit of uh, a party spirit i guess you could call it well how many times in these presentations, especially the last several, have we come away with many things for us to consider mm -hmm. about ourselves and about the movement? Mm -hmm. I grant you the messages have been, have been at times very somber. There is not a lot of socializing that have gone on because of these messages. Yet there has been quite a bit of socializing and social spirit from what others would like to see. Now, socializing is not all bad, but when we are putting socializing and the social gospel ahead of understanding the time in which we're living mm -hmm. are we not worshiping another god absolutely well i saw it happen in in arkansas with the omega 
when we were there in 2018 with the young people yeah. with the young people and 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 I tried to warn them about it I talked to uh, Tamina about what was what I saw happening but of course she wasn't really receptive because she was really one of the ringleaders in that you know having all these social events ice cream parties and and uh, popcorn parties and things like this and which which I'm not really a fan of parties to begin with but um it was just the whole lightness of of things the social environment so when everyone went over to Parminder's movement it you could see that it was a lot of it was about the fun they were having mm -hmm. And the entertainment yeah. okay now that that leads to another point mm -hmm. in this in this study as we were going through some things yesterday mm -hmm. there were a couple of items that i was led to look at today that tie in with what we talked about yesterday, but tie in very differently. The first of which you will find in Manuscript 90 of 1900. Okay, so, well, I guess manuscripts, I gotta go to my manuscripts. Now this, man, this manuscript was diary entries that were written during the month of February of 1900. Okay, so manuscript 90. Right. Right there. So if you come down to paragraph number 36. Okay, so this is letter two? That's no, no, you, you, that's letter two. It said manuscript 90. Okay, there we go. So. Um, it has all these different dates in mine here. Right. Mine doesn't have that. Okay. But I'm down, I'm okay. down here to paragraph 36. Okay. And it starts how? If ever there was a period of time. Okay. Um, So I missed it. It's uh, just be look about uh, February 18th. Okay. Oh, I see. That's why I'm having trouble. Okay. Yeah. If ever there was a period of time when we should live in the sight of the sunshine of the presence of God. Okay. If ever there was a period of time when we should live in the light of the sunshine of the presence of God. It is now in this thy day to know the truth as it is in Jesus. I fear as we see the day of the Lord approaching, we shall get in the habit of sighing and crying for the abominations done in the land and shall not recount the mercies of God, which we see and experience. Mm -hmm. As we see all these signs taking place in the world, we are to lift up our heads and rejoice, for our redemption draweth nigh. Our eyes must not be diverted from our Savior. He is the health of our countenance. I fear we talk too much of the great power of Satan and do not magnify the great power of God as we ought to do, as we have reason to do. We must magnify the Lord by offering praise and thanksgiving to his holy name. The Lord would have our minds wide awake in regards to the necessities of the work to be done to awaken souls, but all must be done with an eye single to the glory of God. Self, self, self will have to be sacrificed at every step. We must have not a thread of selfishness in our plans. Christ 
the only begotten Son of the Father, came to our world to teach all who live in this world to become sons and daughters of the Lord, ever keeping in view that we are to consider that Christ came to our world to present a living example to all in the world to live after the example he has given us, that we might have life, eternal life. How many times are we giving glory to God for the blessings and the examples of these blessings that he's giving to us in our lives? How many times are we lifting up our eyes and lifting up our heads and rejoicing because our redemption draws nigh? Well, especially as we see, you know, the light coming from chronology, from what we have been studying as we've been going through these books. I mean, that's the thing that encourages me the most. I, you know, and, and part of the problem that I see with this focus upon these unprovable theories, these speculative sort of um, ways of looking at things, is one is it's it's really speaking of Satan and his power. It gives us fear, and and it, and it attributes to Satan too much glory because we have nothing really to fear. And it also promotes paranoia. Yeah. Fear, paranoia. Fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So no. so we get, work, we get worked up and anxious about all these things that are coming upon the world instead of focusing upon God's promises and also the work that he's given us to do. So can we not apply these fanciful theories as being the equivalent of the Canaanites and their iron chariots? Mm -hmm. If we're not relying upon the promises of God, if we are not taking God at his word, and we are looking that the iron chariots are where we need to focus, then we are not doing any better than the children of Israel were for their own time. Uh -huh. Now, the other manuscript, and you would find this this is manuscript 125, 1901. Okay. 125? 125 in 1901. You're still in 1900. Oh, no. 1901. Manuscript 125, 1901. Yeah, there we are. Okay, we're going to be looking roughly at paragraph 59. Okay, so maybe if I can get, just hang on. I think I can get this to view hidden. There we go. Well, that doesn't give me paragraph numbers. <laughs> okay, you're gonna, yeah. you're gonna scroll down almost to the end of the document. And you're looking for the verse that begins from 2 Timothy 1, 9. Who hath saved us is what you're going to start looking for. Okay. Okay, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling? Yes. Okay. Who hath saved us? and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. God is not pleased to have his commandment keeping people. Those who have acknowledged the laws of his kingdom cover the altar with their tears as though they were in slavery to a tyrant. God does not require his people to walk mournfully before him. As the representatives of Christ travel heavenward, 
they should not make their journey one of mourning, as though sighing and crying were virtues. We should rejoice in the Lord that we have the high and ample assurance that it is possible for us to keep the windows of the soul open toward the sun of righteousness. If we do this, we shall not be peevish and gloomy, but all light in the Lord. When his light shines into our hearts, we shall not be mournful. We shall not give the world the impression that the service of God is severe, taxing, and unjust. How many times do we praise God in all things? Mm -hmm. How many times do we look to him and thank him for the difficulties that have come upon us? For the time of testing that we are being presented? Because does he test those that are not sons and daughters? Does he choose to test those that are not going to be sons and daughters? No, I mean, he tests his people. Okay. In these situations, as we are being tested, are we not passing through the fire of affliction? Mm -hmm. Is the dross in our lives not being driven out? Are we not seeing that there is the opportunity for character cleansing and for us to accept his robe of righteousness? We have many things to study. Okay. We have many points to address because the overriding premise that we are beginning to see in this in the book of Judges is how righteousness by faith truly works. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, just another point going back to James White's statement there. Sure. His account. Um, so dealing with the Waterton tent, mm -hmm. it was a distraction to to the movement. Mm -hmm. and, and if we look at the 777 days ended on at the start of the camp meeting, right? Right. So that's December 25th. 2021 right okay and then you have the three days an another period of three days because we had a three days symbolically leading up to december 25th so then we have midnight following that and so it's this period of fanaticism that begins on december 25th correct all right yes it's then is going to be addressed on the 14th prior to the 15th is that what happens doesn't it seem like there's some type of a tearing time in between in between from you mean from the 21st or yes. the 1st of december to the midnight cry correct yeah so, so I don't know what that means as far as how things are unfolding in the movement presently, when things will be resolved, when the attention will be averted from the fanaticism and brought back to the message. But we could at least take that as a promise that's going to happen and that this movement will pick up the message that God has given it instead of casting disdain upon it. 
because the mockery that goes on regarding chronology um, should not be happening in this movement. Exactly. But it, but it still continues. And, and because to a large degree, there's many people that never accepted it. But they still, those people are still in this movement, even though they don't really accept it. So, so we're, you know, chronology, we're chronology, the, I was say chronology is a heart of, heart of this movement, I would think. Yeah, but for some people it's not, right? Yeah. So, so we've been in the Exeter camp meeting since December 25th, 2021. Okay. I think that's a very valid point. Mm -hmm. And we have a number of witnesses to that. So, so we have witnesses that come from Odilio's study regarding the 777 and the 780, right, which he's addressing as the pandemic, but it relates, those symbols relate. We also have this witness from Millerite history. And then and then all of the witnesses that we have here in these symbols that we see. I think we're being given evidence of line upon line and things for our consideration mm -hmm. so that we can understand that upon which our faith is based where we can see that palmoni the wonderful number the number of secrets is at work so that there within this movement and within this world, we are going to be able to show that these things are indeed <clears throat> relevant to the time in which we live. That's just a thought. Yes, sir. Um, um, with what uh, Theodore was saying, um, the time of East Kingston, Cup meeting at the start of the 777 days. You had the other churches closing the doors uh, to the Millerite. Right. And um, we would normally connect July, sorry, November, 8th, the 9th of November, uh, 2019. Yeah. To the to Fernander and Tess that movement. They are kind of closing their doors. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, close the door to this movement. Everybody in that movement pretty much uh, defriended me and Facebook or blocked me. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so there's definitely a parallel there. And, and the chart is being presented there. Right at yes. that camp meeting, you're saying. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think today, I think they still put up the charts. Yeah, uh, well, I, I don't know if they still do, but may, probably. Th th it's hard to even watch any of their meetings. They they make them private on, on YouTube and they're very insular in their movement. They're not they're not really trying to proselytize. But anyway. Yeah, thanks for that, Stephen. Okay. On Sunday, we're going to return to Judges Chapter 2. Mm -hmm. Are there any other thoughts or comments at this time? 
for me right now. Okay. All right, shall we close with prayer? Heavenly Father, there are many things for which we are very grateful that you are showing. We ask now, Father, for your guidance in the day that we are to live. Help us that we may indeed show others your character, that we are not gloomy, that we are seeing that your deliverance is coming, that our, redre our redemption draweth nigh. Be with us now, guide us until next we meet. Mm -hmm. I thank you for those that will view this later. I ask Father for a blessing upon them. Be with us each one until we come together again for this, for this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.